In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, today the reading of the Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew chapter 18, where the Lord speaks to us about the importance of making sure that we are not an offense. The psalm that was read today says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. What does it mean to say that we have to remain undefiled? You know, there's this word that we use all the time that I think sometimes we don't fully understand its meaning. The word is purity. When we speak of something being perfectly pure, what we are saying is that we want whatever it is that we are calling pure to be completely undefiled, unadulterated. Imagine if you wish that somebody brought you a cup of water and that cup of water was filled with granules of salt or dirt. You can immediately identify that there is something in there that is not supposed to be there. This water is no longer pure. It has lost its purity because something alien to it has entered into it. And it's funny that the word in English that they use for this is unadulterated. Unadulterated. Where we also get the word adultery. Adultery. When something enters into me that is not meant to be inside me, it removes from me my purity and now I am adultered. I am defiled. And here the Lord is talking to us about how it is that we ought to stay on the path that does not lead to defilement. But it's one thing for me to make personal choices that will bring me into a state of sin and another thing for me to do things that will lead others into a state of sin. The Lord today in the Gospel is talking about the humility and the beauty of children and how it is that we must go back to be like those children to enter into the kingdom. And then he says something very scary, to be honest. He says, Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And this, this sounds very much like a threat. This sounds very much like the Lord is warning us and He's using very colorful images to be able to provoke us into realizing, I am serious. Do not make any of these little children sin. It is one thing for me to bring about a personal sin into my life and another thing for me to become a stumbling block to others. Or else why would the Lord speak about this idea of it would have been better for you that a millstone be hung around your neck and that you were drowned in the midst of the sea? What is he talking about? Is the Lord threatening his children? Is the Lord threatening his children? Yani, is the Lord the kind of person who has two children? Imagine if you wish you have two boys at home and you turn to your younger son and you say, if you hurt your little brother, I will kill you. Either. What kind of father would you be if you said that? Is this what the Lord is doing? Is the Lord threatening one child over another? No. The Lord is forecasting to us what it will be like for us to miss out on the kingdom of God. It is one thing for us to stumble and it's another thing for us to become the source of temptation to others. For us to provoke others into sin. How do I do this? How do I provoke others into sin? by encouraging a behavior that otherwise that person would not have done. You know, once upon a time, people used to have telephones in their home. Once upon a time, Bani, a long time ago. Bani. Today, everyone has their own personal cell phone. But once upon a time, there was this thing that was called a phone that you used to stick onto your wall, and it wasn't always wireless. You would have to walk up to the phone to pick it up and answer it. And people would call the house line. And once upon a time, you could not even see who it was that was calling. You would have to pick up. And every time you would say hello, it was actually a question. You would say hello because you have no idea who it was that was calling you. And so sometimes parents would tell their children to do what? Go then ta telephone. You answer the phone. And they would answer the phone. The parent would be hiding in the background saying, who is it? Who is it? And when the person would say, oh, it's so-and-so, it's tant so-and-so, it's uncle so-and-so, it's so-and-so from church, it's this person. The parent might very innocently say, I'm not here. I'm not here. 
طب وات از ذات؟ لا ابونا انت كده هتعقد الدنيا يو ار جوين تو تيل اس ذات لاينج اند نوت لاينج ابونا ات جاست انسنت ميبي ام بيزي طب واي دو يو انسر ذا فون؟ Why did you answer the phone and why did you encourage the child to do this or that? Taban, today none of us can relate to this because everyone has their own personal cell phones and we just don't answer. But I'm giving you a very silly example so you can understand to what extent I can be a source of stumbling to a person. I am a parent who knows that my children should be fasting, but I don't cook fasting food at home. I am a parent who knows that this phone that I bought for my child, even though he's only eight, And I don't know what eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds are doing with cell phones. If your eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds are driving at that age, or they're taking the bus and they're going to a distance, then buy them a cell phone. But to buy a cell phone for an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old, you are putting the entire internet into their hands. If you do not put protection on that phone, what are you doing to that child? If I am allowing a tablet or Netflix or YouTube to raise my children, to teach my children about life, then what am I doing other than being a stumbling block? If I walk into a room with a plate in my hands and I tell my child, you know you're not supposed to eat in the living room, but I'm holding the plate in my hands, what am I teaching my child? If I tell my child not to scream by screaming at him, what am I teaching my child? If my child comes to church or goes to school and he repeats words that he hears me say at home, and then I get upset at the child for saying those words in public, we have this cycle where this has existed, not only with us, but it existed between us and our parents and their parents before them and the parents before them. There has to come a point where a generation says, enough we break the cycle we break the cycle and we go back to being like those little children those little children who are not an offense to each other those little children who the lord calls humble listen to what he says the question that was asked him who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven and his answer is Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom. Why is he saying that children are humble? I'm talking about the very little children. I'm not sure exactly at what age, but at some point children begin to grow and then they're not really children anymore. They become new creatures. But when they're very, very small, Why are they called humble? A little child allows his parent to pick him up, to move him around, to feed him, to change him, to hug him, to kiss him. We tell little children, say I love you, they repeat I love you. We tell little children, give me a kiss, they give us a kiss. We tell little children, I want a hug, they give us a hug. They're so obedient, they're so loving. Their only desire is to please the parent. They allow themselves to be moved from one place to another. All they know is the safety of the parent. All they know is the trust that they have in their father or their mother. Whenever there is any source of pain, whenever there is any source of hurt in their lives, the only thing they know how to cry out is to say Baba or Mama. That's the only thing that comes to their mind is to scream out Baba or Mama. This humility, this complete surrender, this innocence. We have to go back to that. Taban, we think about this and we think, Abuna, are you suggesting that the Lord wants us to go back to, be, to being as foolish as children? No. He's not saying act like children. He's not saying think like children. Limit yourself to the way the children are limited. He said, be humble as they are humble. Go back to what they are. Last week we celebrated the first year anniversary of a great, a great contemporary saint, Abuna Angelus Il Antoni. We celebrated his first year. Abuna Angelus Il Antoni had reached a point where he completely surrendered his will. Completely surrendered his will. 
Those who were closest to him knew that the man was capable of thinking and speaking and acting very functionally, very functionally. But whenever he was in public, he, wasn't, he would not allow himself to speak unless someone told him to. He would not get up and eat until someone told him it's time to eat. He would not go to bed until it was time to go to someone tell him to go to bed. He surrendered himself completely. The why you don't have to do that. Then you're the hegumen of one of the greatest monasteries. You're the hegumen of St. Anthony's monastery in Egypt. But the man surrendered himself completely. He became like a little child. He became like a little child. This is an extent of holiness that many of us hope to achieve. Another contemporary saint that was exactly like this. Many of you have heard of Abu Nafanus. Abu Nafanus was told by the, by the bishop of his monastery at some point, because a lot of people were coming to the monastery to come visit Abu Nafanus, because people were hearing about Abu Nafanus' miracles and the man was holy. And the bishop was not happy that all of these people were coming to visit and the monastery was turning into a touristic attraction. And so he told Abu Nafanus, you're going to go to the retreat house and you're going to stay there by yourself. No more access to all of these people. It's too much noise. It's disturbing the monastery. You're going to go and stay there. And the bishop walked up to him and he drew a line in the sand with his staff. You know how our fathers, the bishops, have their shepherd staff? He drew a line in the sand. And he said, Mat'adish al this is your limit. You stay here, don't let anybody in, don't let anybody out. And so other priests and other monks would come and confess to him. And he would do this thing wherever he was receiving confessions where they would go for walks together. And he would walk behind the person who was confessing by two feet. So the person is walking and he's walking right behind him like this. And he hears his confession. And at some point, one of the elder monks was walking in the front of him and he was saying his confession. And as he was saying his confession, Abu Nafanus remembered that there was the line that Sayyidina drew that I'm not allowed to cross. And so the monk continued walking and confessing. And at some point, he turned around and he realized that Abu Nafanus was all the way back. He stopped walking. So he turned around, he said, Malik, Abuna, what's wrong? What happened? Why aren't you following me? And his response was, Malish, I can't cross this line. I can't cross this line. We hear these stories and we think to ourselves, this is, this is, sure, okay, that's holy, that's obedient, but that's slightly crazy. It's not crazy. This is becoming like that little child who said, but Baba said, no. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to touch that. These apparently are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But let me tell you, it's these children who are closest to the Father. It's these children in their obedience, in their, in their humility, in their simplicity, that they get to do whatever they want with their Father. There's a beautiful saint from the Catholic Church whose name is Saint Therese de Lisieux. She was born in the 19th century and she died only at the age of 24 years old. She was a nun. She speaks about how it is that we have to become like little children if we want to be able to access the love of God. And in her story, she gives this really beautiful example. She says, when a child has done something wrong, and then they hear their father coming home. Some of you might remember this. You know, when, when your dad comes home and you hear the keys in the door, there's two kind of reactions that you might get. You might have the child who says, Baba's home and they're very excited and they want to go see Baba. And there's the other child who when he hears the keys, he panics. He panics because Baba's home and Mama's going to tell him what I did and I'm going to be in trouble, let me go hide. Saint Therese says, be that, second, be that first child. That first child who when you know Baba's home, be excited to see him, even if you did something wrong. Be that child who is so simple, who runs to your father, who sits in his lap and who tells him, Baba, I did something wrong today. I did something wrong and I know you're going to be upset, but I did something wrong and I need you to forgive me. 
What is a father going to do if their child does that? What is their father going to do if their child runs into their arms, sits in his lap and says, Baba, I did something wrong. I need you to forgive me like you always do. The father's heart is going to melt. The father's heart is going to turn to complete mush. He's going to smile and he's going to say, Khalas, don't do it again. Be that first child in simplicity and in love and in trust that your heavenly father loves you so much that he's willing to receive you no matter what you do. Just recently, one of the fathers was posting a picture. He's holding his child in his arms and the child in front of the entire church grabbed his amma and he took it off his father's head and he placed it on his. Taban, everyone smiled and it was a very cute moment. But this is the simplicity of children. We sit in the king's lap. And we take off his throne and he allows us to place it on ourselves. There is hope for us because we are his children. There is hope for us because he loves us and he only sees us as his children. Don't ever forget who you are to him. You aren't Mr. So-and-so who is the doctor. You aren't Mrs. So-and-so who is the pharmacist. You aren't Mr. or Mrs. or doctor or engineer, Bash Mohandas. None of these titles exist with him. You will always remain that little child that he knew and he loves. Habibi, forgive me for giving you the bad news, but the kingdom of heaven doesn't need engineers because nothing breaks down. The kingdom of heaven doesn't need doctors and pharmacists because nobody gets sick. The kingdom of heaven doesn't need teachers or historians or philosophers because perfection is found in the person that we will be united to. The kingdom of heaven will be filled only with children, not professionals, with children. Continue being the professionals that you are in this world and provide for those that the Lord has given you responsibility towards. But don't ever forget that you are a child of His. Don't ever forget that the whole purpose is to remain a child in the front of Him. The last thing that I will share with you and then we will conclude. In the diaries of the life of Abu Namat al-Miskeen, Father Matthew the poor, it says that he used to keep his little passport picture as a child in the front of him. Not his passport picture, his school picture. There was a little picture of him as a child that he put up on the wall where he used to pray. And he stuck it to the wall where he prays so that every time he came to pray, he would always tell God, Lord, please remember. Please remember. The one who stands before you is not... Father Matthew, the heathen of the great monastery of St. Macarius. Not Father Matthew who's written the books. Not Father Matthew that people speak about. I am nothing more than this little child who has always known you and loved you. Remind me of who I am. We do not come to God with our big problems. We do not come to God with all of these existential questions. None of these things matter if I don't realize that I am first his child. And no matter what our age is, we have to remember that we are his. The kingdom of heaven is filled with his children. Do not lose sight of that. Do not lose sight of the humility that is required for us to turn to Him, to cry out to Him, to allow Him to move us from place to place, to allow Him to tell us where He wants us to be, to allow Him to feed us whatever it is He wants us to feed. If we surrender to Him, then He will guide us. If we offer ourselves to Him, then we will truly be like that little child that He carries and loves and cares for. May the Lord always remind us of who it is that we are in Him. May we always learn to see ourselves the way that He sees us. To God be our glory now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.